Hi and welcome to the fourth video in the marketing strategy course and today is I what I think is the best and most exciting and most fun uh, part of marketing strategy which is we're talking about upgrade. We'll do a quick recap of what we've done so far. So marketing strategy is the process of planning how are you going to achieve a strategic objective. And it starts with asking the question, where are we now? What are the facts? What is the truth about what's going on right now? Then we say, where do we want to go? We get really clear about that, because if, you if you're if you not clear about where you want to go, you can go all over the place and expend a lot of energy and uh, resources for relatively little um, gain. Next, we're moving on to how are we going to achieve that, okay? And we've already introduced the circuit model, which we're going to be using extensively again today, to say, is this viable? So we have an original idea, we have our plan, our hypothesis, which is broken down into brand, product, proposition, problem and market. And we say, okay, do we have a green light on each of those things? Are they clear, meaningful and distinct? Okay, so that's the basic viability check. You shouldn't go to market unless each of those things is good and you've got a green light on them. But the next thing we're going to do is level up because we want to take it beyond just acceptable, beyond just, you know, viable. Because the fact is, if you go to market with something that's just viable, you can expect to make a whole lot of work for yourself and that's not really what we want. We want lots of success. We want to achieve what you want to achieve quickly, easily and you know overachieve if at all possible. So like I say, this leveling up um, is the, if there is one secret to marketing success, I believe this is it. And you'll start to get the feeling that there are themes that are cycling over and over as we work through this stuff. And that's a good thing. Marketing isn't complicated. It's relatively simple. But really, the, the, the trick to upgrading is what you'll get from, from this, this whole talk. And I'm going to try and keep it relatively short because there's a lot of material here. Um, so much we could talk about. Um, but what you'll get from this is definitely this feeling that uh, playing safe is not going to work for you okay so you know real success comes with being an outlier it comes with being on your edge not replicating something that's worked before for other people necessarily because what's always worked before doesn't necessarily work now we're living in a completely different age to where we were 10 or 20 years ago, completely different. The internet has changed everything. So why are we thinking about upgrading? Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons. One of the most important is doing something ordinary is not very inspiring. It's hard to get excited about an ordinary proposition. Okay. Now, as we talk through all of this today, we have to bear in mind, sometimes there are ordinary things. Okay, there are commodities out there in the market. I'm assuming that your business is not really a commodity business. I mean, if you're in the business of wholesale buying of timber or, you know, crude oil or, or something like that, a lot of this doesn't apply to you. And it really does, you know, when you're in very mature markets like that, it does come down to just how efficient can you be. Okay, but um, that aside, we will proceed. Um, as though you have room for manoeuvre in this, because that's what it's all about, okay? If you're selling ordinary, it's harder to sell. Extraordinary is easier to sell than ordinary. You face more com competition if you're selling ordinary, because there's more people are selling ordinary than extraordinary. And you fall into the horrible trap of price pressure. And, the, you know, the worst case of all, a race to the bottom when everyone's trying to undercut everyone else. And it's just a game of chicken to see who can pull up before you hit the ground. You really don't want to do that. Ultimately, it's all more work. It's easier to sell um, when you're selling something remarkable. 
And remember, Risky is the New Safe. Good book, worth a read um, of that title. What was safe a generation ago is now high risk. What seemed high risk a generation ago is now your safer place. This is the old bell curve, right? We're all familiar with it. You don't want to be in the middle thing. I mean, yeah, you know, eventually if you've got a, a product and you want to sell millions of it, then you will be looking at the mass market at some point. If you are at the point of defining your marketing strategy, I'm going to assume that, you know, you, like, as we've already seen, you don't shoot straight for the mass market. You need to start with the innovators and early adopters. Um, if the market for what you're selling is, is going to be relatively young if you're starting from scratch. So just get this in your head. The, the normal range is not the safe place. It's the extremes, it's the edges where we want to be thinking. Okay. This is a really, really powerful question. How can we get others to tell our story? Right? The, as I've worked and thought through everything in marketing over however long I've been doing it, I've come more and more back to the conclusion that PR is incredibly important, right? Um, so SEO is PR. You know, SEO is no longer about building links yourself. You want to be an architect. So you want to create an environment where people want to link to you. You want to create an environment where people want to share your stuff. And, you know, historically, in terms of the various marketing disciplines, that's been PR, public relations, right? It's about getting your message out there into the market. So really, if, if you could sum it up, it comes down to this question, how can we get others to tell our story? How can we get others to share about us so that we don't necessarily have to share about us? Um, and when that happens, then you've got, you know, the, the links will come your way, the social shares will come your way, right? And if you can get others to tell your story, it, it, the prerequisite for that is coming up with a story that people want to share, right? Just remember the story of Boaty McBoatface, if you've, if you've come across that, right? There was a scientific team, they had commissioned a new vessel, new research vessel, I think it's going to, you know, sail in the Arctic, do research. And they came up with a, um, a competition to name the boat. And some clown put, said, we should call it Boaty McBoatface. And everybody voted for it. And it won by a mile. And it was on national news. And it was all over the place, at least in the UK. Um, generated huge attention and PR for this organization. Uh, they made a mistake by overruling the public vote and going with something more ordinary um, but you know what if if they'd gone with Boaty McBoatface they they could have rode that wave for a long time if they could have said you know today in Hull Boaty McBoatface is going to and people would have turned out in their thousands to see this they, they couldn't you can't buy promotion like that and it starts with doing something remarkable simple as that so the question, how can we get others to talk about us and tell our story, forces you to stay out of that middle normal ground and do something remarkable. The playwright Oscar Wilde famously said, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. And this definitely applies. Being talked about in a negative way can be a good thing. Okay, so just, just bear that in mind as we work through it. Is there a process to upgrade? Not really. There isn't a roadmap to uncharted territory by definition. Right? That's kind of the whole point of what we're talking about. We're talking about finding something original, distinct, but not. we're, we're not trying to be original for the sake of being original. Right? We're, we're, it's more about expose, discover, uncover, and project freely 
your natural originality. What is unique about what you do? Okay. I think a lot of time what we do is we put on the suit. You know, we we go out and we think, well, everyone else is wearing that suit. Everyone else behaves like that and looks like that and uses this language. And so that means we should do that. And what happens when you do that? You get a whole line of people look exactly the same and sound exactly the same. And everyone's page says, welcome to blah, blah, Inc. You know, we're a customer driven oriented, blah, blah, blah. And you get all the, you know, the, the BS that you see all over the place. And for a customer, it then makes it incredibly difficult to know which one of these thousand identical clone things is, is the one for you. How do you tell the difference between them? They all sound the same. They all look the same. Actually, if you've got one of there who's dressed like Elvis and one who's dressed like a pantomime clown, at least, you know, you've got something to make a decision. It makes you make a decision. Is that right for me? No, I don't want a clown, right? But at least you made a decision. And that clown is going to have more chance of, of getting a, a yes than the other 999. So we do have the circuit model and we are going to use the circuit model. So basically what we're, what we're doing is we're going to look at each element of the circuit. Those five fundamental basic things, those elements of your business proposition, your whole business idea. And we're going to say, how can we crank it up? How can we upgrade that thing? Right? So, you know, the five basic things, brand, product, proposition, problem, market. Okay. And I believe that when you get those five things maxed, right, you get them to turn them up to 11, your campaign will practically write itself. Okay? It ceases to be an issue of what techniques and tricks and methods and channels and, you know, marketing hacks do we need to use because it, your, your, your campaign will run itself. It, it will do its own thing. And that's how it works. You will also notice as we work through things that if you tweak one of the things, it's almost like the elements are in interconnected with elastic. Okay, If you move one of them up, it will affect the ones around it. And you'll, you'll, you'll get a feel for that as we work through this stuff. So, oh yeah, this is, this is a great one. Always be trying to think, right? I'm a big believer in moving up market. I think that uh, working at the top, higher end of the market is far easier than working at the lower end of the market. So if you can, keep this in your mind that you want to be a brand, a business, or whatever it is, where people say about you, ah, oh, them, ah, oh, you know, you pay a bit more, but, okay, so what's the but? Yeah, you pay a bit more, but you know when you hire them, the job is done. You know that, whatever it is. So what's that but? You pay, you pay a bit more, but whew, man, right? What is that thing? That's your thing. That, and that's your brand. You know, brand is nothing to do with logo and all that stuff. The brand is when people say your name, then hear your name, ping. What happens in there? That's your brand. Your brand is the emotional or, or cognitive response that people have to your entire business and everything affects it. And you can't force it on people, right? So, you know, yes, it's to do with the style and the design and everything of, of your stuff. You know, the Apple's packaging has a big impact on Apple's brand, but that's because it's actually a very good expression of Apple's brand. It isn't the brand, it's an expression of it. Um, yeah. So when you've got your branding straight, but it has to come through everything. It has to come through the packaging. It has to come through the service. It has to come through the copywriting, the ads, the customer service, the people on the phone, right? And it can be um, very easily ruined. Brands are still very, very important. So let's start with that. Okay. Look at brand. We need brands more than ever, I believe. Um, they've not been around for all that long, you know, a couple of hundred years. Um, 
Today we have more information, um, more knowledge. There's, there's something like 80% of the world's data has been created in the last two years and that will always kind of be true. Right? There's huge amounts of information and we are drowning in it. We're getting dizzy from it. We're getting sick of it. We've got information sickness. So what we need more than ever is brands that we can trust to help us to navigate the soup of information that's out there. Right? We need to be able to know, oh, if I buy X, you know, I, I can stop worrying about that. Okay? Brands are extremely important. So I want you to be thinking. What can we be that's more awesome than what we are now? And you have a choice about that. You are not condemned to being the same business that you have been yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago. Right? You can be something more awesome and it's all down to self-belief. So can you be the thing, the person, the source for the whatever it is? Okay. That all speaks to the, the being the, the number one thing. And that, that doesn't mean that you go out saying, rah, 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 we're number one. But try and be number one. Why not? Be the absolute best you can be. But what is that? What is the est of it? You know, the fastest, the nicest, the whatever it is ist. So you should come up with an est. What is your est? Of course, you cannot copy any other business out there particularly if they're the leader, because they've already done that. They're already it. So it's it's too late. You know, you need to find... Um, there's a saying that says, uh, you know, be yourself because everyone else is taken. And it's true. Don't, tr don't try and be anyone else. Just be the most awesome version of you. And that will work far better. So more tips on how to upgrade your brand. You will find your upgrade on your edge. That's the edge of your comfort zone, the edge of your self-belief. Right? You won't find it in the past. Right? To, to get something you've never got, you've got to do something you've never done. It's, and your edge is informed by your past, as we've said before. And it's also informed by the future, the future that you are pulling yourself towards. What is the best vision of yourself that you can step into, right? Um, without feeling that you're lying to yourself. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe that, you know, if I say, you know, I am the, I'm the marketing strategist. I'm the, I'm the marketing strategy guy. Can I say that and believe it? How about take a stand, you know, stand for something. And that can very often mean standing against something, right? So if I blog about ethical marketing and, you know, I can blog against unethical practices, right? And you know what, when you do that, there's so many people suddenly pop up and say, I'm so glad that you are writing about this thing. People that I never knew were out there, right? And there's stuff that you can't research like that. There is limits to market research. Tell you what, if you base all your decisions on what you can prove before you take that step, you're going to be in that safe zone. You're going to be in the, well, the old safe zone, now the risky zone. You're going to be in the normal zone. Yeah? Because that's just, it's just the way it is, right? You base anything on just the past, what has worked, that's not what's going to work tomorrow. How can you take a stand? How can you be a movement? So take what you do. Is there something that you can say, I'm going to make a movement out of this. I'm going to make a tribe out of this. You know, we're going to, this is a parade. Let's, um, I think it's in the book Zag. Martin Neumeier says the best, best advice he was given was find a parade that's waiting for its leader. Right? What is on the tip of everyone's tongue? What, what is it time for? What is the world waiting for next? And can you be that? Can you say, come on, everyone, let's do this, right? Start an army, start a tribe, find your people, you know, be a leader in something, okay? Talked about this forever. I'm going to keep talking about it because it's always going to be true. You've got to polarize. And we've been, you know, touching on this already. Polarization means that you are a strong magnet. Now, a strong magnet has a powerful North Pole and it has a powerful South Pole. 
you can't get one without the other. So what that means is, in terms of your business or your brand, that if you are polarized, if you are powerful, then you will attract your ideal kind of client. Now, they're like the opposite magnet to you, okay? But by equal measure, you must necessarily repel the others. So there will be you know, a portion of the market that's there that is right for you. And there will be a portion of the market, probably a much, much larger portion, at least 80%, right? That is not right for you. And if you're not repelling the people who are wrong, you're probably not attracting powerfully the people who are right. So this means stand for something, stand against something, know who you are and what you stand for, and let that be you know, visible to the world. Polarize your business, don't be afraid of it. Here's a great example. Um, little craft brewer in the UK, Brewdog, Scottish I think, um, started just a few years ago, and they have had incredible results year on year. Now, is like 52% increase in turnover last year. The profits have gone up by about 100% every single year since 2011. And they have crowdfunded, they've got a thing, a, a crowdfunding campaign where you can actually buy into the business, get shares in the business, um, called Equity for Punks. And they've, so since they started around 2010, they've raised 20 million pounds since then. So that's, that's a whole heap of money. <clears throat> and you can see by their branding that they are on the edge. They're on their edge, right? And, you know, to call your beer punk, it's, it's saying something. You know, the labels are tactile. And, and just check out some of the things they, they say about themselves, right? This is uh, off their website. So there's a tweet that says, Bigger companies want to buy Brewdog. Go away, silly big companies. Brewdog is not for sale, especially not to you. Right? Now, that's not what you would call professional language. right? But that's a business as being its own character and its own personality. Right? It's saying we are anti the big business. right? So it's, it knows who its market is. And it's not afraid just to, you know, to buck the, the, the trend. Um, also... Just, just below this from uh, from this article, past year has seen Brewdog press on as an independent business, launching the world's strongest canned beer. Right, so it's, there's an est in there. Right, it's world's strongest beer, um, twelve point seven percent Black Eyed King Imp. It also attracted controversy when it produced what it terms the world's first transgender beer called No Label. Right, transgender beer. It doesn't even make sense, but controversy is a good word. Right? That means people are talking about you. It means you stand for something. It means that you have polarized who you are and what you do to the point where people care enough to pick up a pen or, or do something about it. Right? This is an example. And I don't care if you, you love the idea of Brewdog or hate it. It doesn't matter. But much better to be loved or hated than to be in the middle. Right? You'll find, if you go on Amazon you'll find that there are books that have, you know, lots of five-star reviews, but also quite a few one-star, low ones. You know, books tend to either be, you know, loved and hated, or more in the middle, right? Better to be loved and hated than in the middle. So just a few examples. I'm going to try and keep this relatively brief. Uh, dog walking. My wife and I came up with a concept a few years ago because right, we, we walk dogs. We have four dogs right now. We love dog walking. We spend a couple of hours every day walking our dogs. We throw them in the back of the van. We take them to a different location every day. We open the back of the van. They run out, right? They, they, they don't walk on leads. They run until they're tired. They swim. They jump around. They chase sticks, okay? There's a lot of dog walkers out there. And we, th we looked at this and went, well, why don't we offer people dog walking our way? So we started to put together a brand. We were going to call it Rough Explorers, as in Rough, um, R-U-F-F. And because we thought there are some people out there who would love for their dogs not just to be walked, but to be a rough explorer. It's like every day, go somewhere else. You know, really have a run around, have a good time. Maybe, you know, get 
washed and dried before you get brought home, right? But what that's saying is that there's, there's a market that's got a very normal kind of attitude. And, and we're saying, well, let's stir that up. Let's do, do it a different way. And a lot of people won't want to do that. And that's fine. Because you know why? Because there's loads of dogs out there. The market is huge. The market for pretty much everything is big enough now. You don't have to appeal to the mass market because if you appeal, if, if, you, if you get a brand or product or something that is unobjectionable to the majority, it's unlikely to be perfect for the minority that you need. Okay, so think about that. There could be brands out there that keep getting chosen above yours because they stand for something. Dent repair, um, I could do a whole session on this. My friend Dave Stream, uh, been you know working together for a few years now. Um, Dave came to me. He's like you know an expert in paintless dent repair. So he pops dints out of your car bodywork. He's been doing it for years, and we were having conversations about how can we you know increase that business, take it a step further. And um, Dave has now got a remarkable strategy together. The guy's gone out and bought dentrepair.com, which was on the market for, I don't know the exact figure, but he says he could have bought several trucks for the price of, of that. Okay, so he's really invested, really going out, going for the top of the market. And the strategy revolves around you know, creating the, the Dent Repair Association. Right? And really being the leader, stepping forward as the king of the PDR guys in the USA. There's a lot more layers to it than that. But, you know, it's just an example of how you can take, you know, my shop and say, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an army around this. Right? I'm good at this. I speak its language. How can we take it to a different level? Create a professional association, I've said it before, you know, is a really, really fascinating strategy. When Steve Jobs, um, Steve Jobs got ousted from Apple for a time, uh, 1980s, and then came back in about 91, I think. Um, at that time, Apple's former premises had the Apple Museum in the foyer of the main entrance when you went in. Steve went in and said, get rid of that. Right? People don't want to come in and see Apple's history. That's not what Apple's about. He said Apple is about technology meets art. That's it. End of story. If anything is outside of that isness, Apple is technology and art. This beautiful marriage of technology and art. Forget it. We don't want it. Get rid of it. Okay. So they, they you know, archived the museum. They took it away because it was all about looking forwards. That's what the brand stands for. So very often, what you'll find is that um, honing and upgrading your brand is as much about removing bits as it is adding bits. You know, a beautiful sculpture like Michelangelo's David was a big lump of marble, right? But it was made by removing the right bits. There was nothing added to it. Okay. So sometimes you might have to remove products that don't represent your brand. You might have to remove markets that don't represent your brand. They're not you. They're not right for you. And what you're left with is something that's a lot more pure and a lot more elegant. We also worked a few years ago with a firm of financial advisors. And our recommended strategy to these guys was, because we were faced with this problem, well, you know, financial advisors are really, really boring. So, you know, what can we do? How, how on earth can we make financial advisors interesting? So, you know, so we, Sally and I sat down with them because she's from a, a finance background. And we went, don't, don't, don't try and make, make it interesting. In fact, why don't you put out grey adverts, okay, that, that, that really play and maximise the boringness of financial advisors? It's like, do not invite us to dinner. We are so boring. All we think about and all we talk about is financial products and, you know, all this kind of stuff. We are the worst dinner guests ever, right? Please feel free to hire us to manage your money. 
but don't, for God's sake, invite us around to dinner because we'll bore the socks off all your guests, right? Something like that. It's like, take the boringness and boost it. Take it to the next level. Okay, we move on to product. How can you play with product that you offer? Your product is what you do, right? What do I do? I do, I deliver consulting or I produce widgets in boxes and ship them, right? Your product is what does the client get? Right? So how can you take that to another level? Well, the key of it is in value. So you can take what you do and say, well, how can I deliver the maximum value with this? So you may say, you know, I will work with you until your problem is gone. Or I will, you know, I will work for a year or I, you know, I only take on three clients and I will give my, you know, my all to doing this. What's the most value that you can even conceive of in your mind, right? And then maybe you can do that. Because the value that people perceive that you have derives from the value that you deliver. And the value that they believe you deliver. What is the biggest difference you'd like to make in the world? Do not play small. Right? Go and look up the Marianne Williamson uh passage you know or poem or whatever it is you know your your greatest fear is not that you are inadequate your greatest fear is that you are it that you are adequate beyond measure you know who are you to play small get creative with your stack this is real this is really powerful okay so your stack means that um i mean have you been delivering one thing right for a while you can deliver at multiple places in the stack concurrently and they will support each other, partly because your market can migrate up and down the stack over time. I've had people who have bought a book one year and then five years later come back to me and said, I'd like to hire you, right? You can't plan for that. You can't measure that stuff. But yeah, if, if you're going to be the something in your niche, then own it. Put the DIY free material out there. Put the blog posts out there. Write the articles. Yeah, Produce the books. Produce the courses, if that's possible. And produce the high-end high -end consulting. Right? Or have a, a membership group. Right? You, could, you can work at multiple levels in the stack. We could exhaust this. We could go, we'll talk about this just this one thing for days. But consider every level. Right? What would it look like if you offered your stuff in a DIY context? And we're going to have examples about that. What about done with you? How can you work with a group, right? Or how can, um, can you sell pe people your time so that they can get onto Skype with you and you can help them to solve their problems, right? What about done for you? You know, parachute in, solve people's problems for them at the highest level of performance that you could possibly do. Free DIY is excellent and I, I really, really recommend it. It's what I built my business on just just starting to write blog posts in 2004 about what I knew about web design okay and just by sharing that gets you the exposure gets you the social shares the links right builds your name right because I did that and then because I went out and wrote an ebook um, that ebook then got noticed by Ken McCarthy you know godfather of internet marketing who you know was impressed, invited me to speak, and then, you know, everything happens from there. There's no, there's no chance to, to all of this stuff. It's about, you know, put it out there. You know, the free DIY stuff is incredibly important. Do it. At the other end of the market, the whole white glove concierge service, you know, can you really boost your, your, your product or service to another level? Right? And there's, there, there is always another level. And done with you can also be very interesting, particularly in the days of video conferencing, right? So you can, you know, I, I, I'm at the moment I'm running a done with you group around this material. This is free material, and I'm, I've got a done with you premium group of people who want to work through this material with my help. Okay, and it's working. It's great. A few little examples. Um, the Audi A2. There was uh, a new boss came into Audi 
quite know, about 15 years ago or something, Audi used to have this car called the A2. It was like a small family hatchback. And it was pretty cute. I liked it. Um, but it was two-wheel drive and it was small. And the new boss came in and said, first thing, that's gone. Forget that. He says, Audi don't make small cars. Right? So how is that upgrading the product? Well, it's it's like having a tiny car on their range was diluting the Audi range. He said, Audi don't stand for that. Audi stand for, you know, robust, four-wheel drive, high-performance rally cars, etc. Okay? And I think, in retrospect, he was right. There's a lot of vehicle manufacturers who are so diluted because they try and do so many different things. You don't know what they stand for anymore. You don't know what they mean. I love this idea. I've got a uh, a fictional vacuum clean, cleaner repair guy in my in my mind that I keep going back to. I say, well, you know, if somebody's got something as ordinary as a high street vacuum cleaner repair shop, how can that person do internet marketing? And I'm thinking there are ways. So um, let's say he gets a job in. Right, so he's got somebody brings a Hoover in and it's broken and it doesn't work. And, and he says, okay, well, let's film it. I'm going to show you how to, this is one of the most common problems with the so-and-so thing, right? Records the video, which, I mean, these days, how hard is it? We're all carrying a video studio in our pockets, okay? Records it, puts it on YouTube with the model number and everything. And people find, there's people in other countries or other cities who are never going to be his clients. This is the whole point, you know. You say, well, if I put it out there, I'm, I'm just, you know, going to be noticed by people who will never buy from me. It's like, good. Um, they'll never be his clients. But those people will share and like and, you know, link and all these things. And all of that will boost his, you know, rankings for his, you know, his main page, if that's important, if he's even got one. It might even be a Facebook page. It doesn't really matter. But... On the back of that, he can also do a thing where, like, if you're struggling with this, then instead of putting your vacuum cleaner in your car and driving it to my town or whatever, get on Skype with me. You can book half-hour slots with me, and I will talk you through over Skype how to fix the thing. That's done with you. He's not fixing it. He's helping you do it, right? And all of that could help him rank higher. He could he could have vacuum cleaner repair dot whatever for his country before too long because he has attracted way more links than anyone else in that business and how's he done it by just giving away what he's already doing and showing people how he does it because there are people there are some people who will always try and fix it themselves okay and that's fine we need to serve those people and there are people who would like help and there were people who you know can't think of anything worse than fixing your own vacuum cleaner but i want to bring it to the guy who's the guy Vac vacuum cleaner repair, bang vacuum cleaner repair .com. Find a thing he could be in the link selling business, but uh, the the lead generation lead selling business before he knows it. How do you make more profit from wine? I've used this example before. It's always worth going over again. Okay, so you have a small shop, and your shop sells, among lots of other things, it sells wine. Okay, so you've got a bottle at three ninety nine. You've got a bottle at five ninety nine. You've got a bottle at seven ninety nine. Okay, this came from a book on the psychology of price. I think uh, can't remember the author. Apologise. And um, so, in the example, you can make one change to this range. What's that change going to be? And you want to maximise the profit that you make on your wine. The market is the same size, right? The market is the same people coming into your shop. Nothing else changes. You can make one change to this range. What's it going to be? Okay, um, is it making the cheapest one cheaper? Is it making the more expensive one more expensive? No. Apparently, research shows that the way to increase your average, well, your overall profit on the range is add another flagship product way out in the top end. And the reason for that is that you'll find... it. A lot of people, some people will always buy the cheapest. Some people will always buy the cheapest but one. Some people will always buy the most expensive but one. Okay. So what you'll find is when you've only got 
three ninety nine, five ninety nine, seven ninety nine. You'll sell a bunch of the five ninety nine ones, and you won't sell many seven ninety nine. But if you add the high end, the high price bottle into there, suddenly what does that do to seven ninety nine? It's like, well, that seven ninety nine bottle is now mid range. I'm a mid range buyer. I will buy their seven ninety nine. So you'll sell a lot more. You might not sell any at fifteen ninety nine. Don't matter. That's not its job. Right? You may, you know, get one person who comes in who's just really flash and, and likes to spend the most. Fair enough. You might sell one or two of those. But what will happen is you'll sell more of the seven ninety nine than you were before. Because it was the edge marker of your range. What is this got to what does this mean to, to your business? Well, this is where the white glove concierge flagship product or flagship service can come in. If you add a product or service into the range that you offer, that is, wow, that's a big ticket thing, but look at what they're promising. You know, that's, these guys must be so good, right? It makes, it redefines everything else that you offer. It's like, wow, this guy does $10,000 a day copywriting. I'm going to buy his book on copywriting. I want to, I want to learn his secrets, right? It doesn't mean that you're selling lots of that stuff. And I'm not saying we should go out and lie about what we do, right? But, you know, go out, add something that is the biggest commitment, the biggest, hairiest, boldest product, most valuable thing that you can conceivably offer. And it will reframe everything else in your range. So the meeting point between product and problem is proposition. How can you boost up the proposition, right? If product was about the most value that you can conceivably offer, right? Proposition is a good way of thinking about it is this is a promise to solve a problem, okay? So how can we max that promise to the point where people go, whoa, I wasn't expecting that, okay? Don't, don't feed people's expectations. Blow away their expectations. So what's the biggest challenge that you can take on? What's the biggest, boldest promise that you can make? Look at your competition and think, what daren't your competition say, right? What, what promise, if, you know, would scare them, okay? And then say, can we step up? Can we step up and make that promise? Or a promise like it. And the the result of this could be, right, that you create what's called an irresistible offer. Brilliant book by Mark Joyner. Definitely get hold of it, right? The irresistible offer. Short book. Read it. Make an irresistible offer. So somebody's like, I've got that problem. And then you go, bang, there it is on a plate. And they go, okay, fine, done. <laughs> you know, that's an irresistible offer. Okay, now think about this. Instead of you going out to the market and putting a lot of work into trying to persuade your, cus your prospects that you're right for them, okay? What if you went out to the market with an offer that was just so right for the market? It's like... It's my dream thing is just, you know, come over the hill, okay? Um, your offer is so right that people are putting in the effort to hire you, right? They're applying to work with you, right? They, they come to you. you. You could have a line of customers outside your door on a Monday morning and you get to pick which customers you want because you don't have to say yes necessarily to every single customer. And that, that could be whether you, you might make furniture for a living. You might be a, a healer or a masseur, right? This applies to service and, and to products. Um, but you can get to choose your customers. Wouldn't that be a much nicer situation than thinking, oh, you know, I have to take this ordinary, boring-ass product out to the market and try and persuade people that it's right for them? No! This the, Upgrading... Is about if you've got a boring ass product, fix your stupid product, make it better, make it awesome. 
Right? Make it irresistible. And then let people just come to you. There's a lot of talk about funnels, and I think that funnels are, you know, kind of a sign of ordinary. Okay? Um, so if, if the, the idea of a, a sales funnel has been around for ages. Oh, we've got you know, X many customers at the prospecting stage and then, you know, how many have shown interest and how many have had their sales call and how many have requested a demo and, you know, you lose some at every stage and it's it's kind of very analytical and numeric and measured and, and you know, whatever, quantitative. Um, and very reductionist, right? <clears throat> and then hopefully people drop out the funnel at the bottom. Right, so now we need to need raw people because you know ninety six percent of people drop out at some point during the sales process, etc. How about instead of having a funnel that starts really really wide and comes down to a point, have a pipe, right? Where you go out and because you've got a laser sharpened proposition, you know exactly who you're selling to. You know exactly what their problem is. You know exactly what you stand for. You are the solution to their problem, right? And they can see that from your business card. You're the, it's like, wow, I am the solution to your problem business card. Right? Um, we don't, you're not just you know, delivering customer value. That bullshit, right? You've got that. So you go out and you find the exact right customers and they just drop straight through, straight through that funnel. What you're not having to do there is all the effort and the grinding that it takes to mince that stuff, you know, most of which you lose anyway. So you, re you really want to spend the money on going out to market to get 100 customers in the hope of 100 prospects into your funnel in the hope that after you push all that stuff through, you get three or four customers out the end. That doesn't even make sense. Just go out for the three or four customers. Go out for the perfect customer, which is going to bring us all on to problem and market. Okay, The customer value triangle is a wonderful tool. Really great little tool. Okay, So it stands for three things. There's quality and there's speed and price. Okay, You may have heard this in another uh, kind of context. Um, where people say, okay, you can have fast, cheap, or good, pick two. Fast, cheap, good, pick two. Right. So what this means is, imagine that you can spin this triangle around. Okay. So you can spin it so that quality and price are uh, kind of equal priority. And then if you do that, then you'll find that speed has to go, you know, out the window a bit. Or you could have, you know, quality and speed. I want a high quality product and I want it fast. Well, in that case, you're going to have to pay for it. Okay. Um, so one example that I quite often use about this is looking at like uh, burgers. So you can have McDonald's, which is about high speed, high price, and you can't get high quality with that. Right? You can get dependability. Or you could have the complete opposite. You could have a you know handmade gourmet burger place where it's all about quality and the speed speed is low and, and you know it, it's not cheap either. Right? And either one is great. That's a couple of things to bear in mind. Whatever, whichever way you want to spin this triangle is fine, right? But know what you stand for. And the second thing is, spin your triangle in the to match what your market wants. What and and there are also markets at every point. There's you know a huge market for McDonald's hamburgers. There's a huge market for gourmet handmade hamburgers. Right? It's all good. You just need to know which is your area, and then you your offering will match the you know the matching market who want quality and are prepared to pay and are prepared to wait or you know the opposite okay so this is part of the circuit questionnaire get clear about it but also think okay if we're about quality or if we're about speed or if we're about you know low price which is all fine can we push that 
how far can we push that? How far can we push the quality of the speed or the efficiency? Always worth thinking about. Okay, so a few thoughts about um, upgrading your proposition. Uh, I want to show you Tip Ladies Fine Woodworking website. So just check out this website. This was done by, um, I think, Jordan Dick from uh, Venturi. Um, maybe with Sarah Peters as well, I believe. Okay, so custom cabinets for home and home improvement for Hudson Valley perfectionists. Okay, so what do we see there? The product is there. It does custom cabinets and home improvement and his market is there. Hudson Valley, geographical and perfectionist. He's literally going out for the, the market of perfectionists. He wants perfectionists. Okay, this all came out of an excellent interviewing process. Okay, so it starts with a quote. You're going to love your new handcrafted custom cabinets. I guarantee it. Okay, what's that? Proposition. He's not selling cabinets. He's selling handcrafted custom cabinets that you are going to love. You see the difference? So he's in the market for people whose need, i.e. problem, is I don't just want custom, I, I want the best. And he goes on to say, your cabinets and shelving will fit together seamlessly to millimetre perfection with zero wasted space. Your kitchen drawers, hinges and doors will last a lifetime because I only use the highest quality, etc. If you want distinctive cabinetry or if you have a small renovation that requires the detail of a craftsman, let's discuss it. All right? And if you go down, he says, look at this. I measure carefully. I take a little bit longer and charge a little bit more. But here's what you get. I'll design, etc. Okay, and I won't leave until you are 100% delighted. So you can just feel this is a homepage. And we haven't even moved off the homepage. This is, this is a website from a guy who, you know, the marketing strategy is nailed. He knows exactly where he is on the speed, quality, price thing. It's like, I take longer. I take as long as it takes. And in fact, I'm not going to leave your house until you say... I love the cabinets, right? Now there are people, there are more people who are not in the market for that kind of work than there are who are in the market for that kind of work. And that's always going to be the case, always. Because every market has multiple layers in it. And what he's doing here is he is polarizing his message for the perfectionist market, because he's good enough to do that, right? So the question for us is, how can you push one of those elements to that point? Next example, which you may well have come across, and I'm sure it's in uh, Mark Joyner's Irresistible Offer book, Domino's 30 Minute Promise, I think was from the 1980s. Um, it said basically, fresh pizza delivered hot to your door within 30 minutes or it's free. Right? Beautiful example of an irresistible offer. Because it's saying, this is, you know, it's, it's freshly made pizza, it's hot, and it's, it's perfectly solving your problem. You're hungry, right? And you go, I'm hungry, what can I eat? Okay, Domino's Pizza, and I know. That's going to be at my door within 30 minutes or it's free. Okay, that is an example of taking your promise and cranking it up to the level that it scares your competition. All right, perfect example. Very similar one, UPS, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Okay, and they're using, you know, they're not just saying when it has to be there overnight, it's absolutely positively has to. They're really driving it home, okay? Why, why do that? Well, it's because we need to lean out that bit further than your competition can, right? And when you do that, nobody else can then bring out a when it's something bum bum has to be there overnight because UPS has owned it. They completely owned it. Moving on to the last couple of areas, the problem. How can we take out a, a you know take on a more ambitious 
problem. And great piece of advice, if you're in any doubt about you know, where to start with this, start with the problem. Because when you've got a problem, that's the starving crowd, right? Start with a bigger problem. If you're not clear about what, you know, or you've got, like, there's all these different things I can do. I'm not quite sure what kind of something I want to be. I'm not quite sure what kind of products I want to, and services I want to offer. You know, what should my proposition be? Find the problem first. When you can find the problem, and the problem is very closely connected to the market, you know, it's elastic, elasticity. You can find a problem that is motivating and powerful and everything else. Um, and you know that people have that problem, either by research or by common sense, which is just as valid, then, you know, you can design the rest around that. You can end up designing all the way back to your brand, right, all around fixing that problem. So say, yeah, my problem is, whatever, look, what's the biggest and most common or most acute, most motivating, most painful problem that you can solve? Think about it. Think about all the things that you can do. What's the worst problem that you can solve with those skills, with those resources that you have? How can you max that? Right? And then you know, work backwards from there if you need to. Focusing on less is generally a good idea. So instead of saying, well, you know, we can do this and we can do that and we can do this and we can do the other. Okay, well, what, what's, what's the most motivating one of those problems? Work on that one. Specialize on that one. Do you really think that by reducing the scope of what you do, that you're going to reduce it to the point where there's no market left? Seriously. No. You're going to find that actually your market suddenly knows why they need you. In, because, you know, f for, by the very reason that you're not trying to offer lots of different things, lots of different men, you're not a Swiss Army knife. Swiss Army knife has got a pen knife and a little saw and a magnifying glass and, you know, a bottle opener and a can opener and all these things, but they're all not very good, right? It's got a poor quality knife. They're all poor quality because they can't be as good as the dedicated tool for doing that job, All right? So don't be a Swiss Army knife. Do what you can do best. You don't have to do everything you can do. You don't have to try and solve every problem that you can solve. What's the biggest, nastiest, hairiest, most painful, most motivating problem you can solve? A well-defined problem can mean that your prospect feels you already understand them. Right? If you, if you can say, you know, I'm looking for people who want their drawers to fit like that. When, you're, when you put that in front of, you know, there may be 30 people who go, yeah, well, me. Right? And then when you come to that person and they go, that's, you're talking to me. It's like, how did you know? How did you know that mattered so much to me? So I didn't. But you, when you take that stance, that position that you act like, you know, I am speaking to my perfect, my ideal customer. When your ideal customer comes along, they'll recognize themselves in what you're saying. So think about narrowing your market down by problem, because market and problem are very close. What are the types of problems that you can solve that your ideal customers have, your ideal, your best future customers, right? You may be able to run a business with kind of middle order problems that you address, but what, what do your perfect customers, your ideal either present or future customers, what are the problems that they specifically tend to have? So my advice would be, if you can isolate that, push the other stuff off the table, focus on those best, biggest problems. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of problem upgrading. And we're going to look at clean language, we're going to look at Snore Razor and Gen Plus. 
so we're actually going to look at the home pages of these three propositions. So we will start with clean language. Now, clean language is an extraordinarily broad uh, kind of methodology. It's a way of interacting, a uh, professional uh, facilitator interacting with a client that is completely non intrusive. And it can apply to therapy or counseling or mediation or, you know, all kinds of different areas um, or coaching. But the problem is almost by the nature of its incredibly broad usefulness, it makes it extremely hard to market. Almost in a situation where um, you, you have to market to people who already know they need clean language because they've heard of it. It's also very relatively young right in the terms of technology adoption so um for this when i was working with sharon small who runs the clean language institute in california you know we've we have struggled for a while to find out how to market it and um there's been a few areas where we've got some very you know interesting developments one is um in interviews so you know clean language can be really powerful for interviewing but what we do is because, you know, because the market isn't out there thinking, oh, we need this, this tool. But there is a market out there thinking we need to run our interviewing more effectively. So, you know, sometimes what you can do is you can reframe the problem that you address by almost going to a more specific problem that's more acute and more conscious, and more front of mind than the most obvious one that's in front of you. Another really interesting area um, is to do with uh, counseling and, and assistance for families that have a young person with a drug, drug problem. You know, it's been found that this kind of approach is incredibly powerful in that context. And that is an incredibly powerful problem. So, you know, a couple of different areas that we're looking at in that one. I wanted to show you this for Snore Razor. Snore Razor is a very interesting product it's an audio file that you can purchase and that when played through earbuds or whatever totally camouflages the sound of somebody snoring even if they're right next to you in a way that white noise cannot do um, noise cancelling headphones or whatever cannot do but just so what this is this is just below the fold on the home page right it says finally you can totally block out so big bold promise right that's big proposition, the sound of your partner snoring. So we are talking directly to people. This is the market, right? They sleep or they want to trying to sleep next to somebody else who snores, right? And they do it far more effectively than even the most expensive noise cancelling headphones or earplugs, which is true. Allowing you to sleep peacefully side by side with zero snoring noise disturbance. Okay. So, you know, with the problem is absolutely evident here. It's like I know who I am talking and exactly who I'm talking to. Partner s trying to sleep next to somebody else, somebody snores, keeps you awake, right? So that you can sleep peacefully and that's the result that you want, okay? That's the real hook, sleeping peacefully. And Gen Plus, um, another one by Jordan that, that you know we uh, had a lot of fun working on. Uh, again, you can just see at the, at the top of the screen there, it's got the um, the locations that they, that they serve. Good for SEO. Now, what was interesting from this is that this is a business that sells generators. Okay. But that, okay, so generators is the product. But the problem here isn't... The proposition here isn't, oh, you clearly need a generator. The problem isn't, I need a generator. What they found by using the testimonials first um, approach was that people were saying, you know, I need peace of mind. So this is actually, they are in the business of selling peace of mind to the extent where the headline on the homepage says, you deserve the peace of mind that comes with an automatic standby generator. And then the quote immediately underneath. So this is before they've said anything about who they are, what products they sell or how they do it. They are talking directly to the soul, the center of the problem. 
Right, this guy, John Young, real testimonial. I needed the generator so I could a sense of security that the house wouldn't freeze. My wife is not technically inc mechanically inclined, and knowing she doesn't have to do anything whatsoever, that's fantastic. Okay, so the selling relief, the selling peace of mind. So they know that the problem is the stress and worry and concern about leaving her house in case there's a cold spell and you know the heating doesn't work. So, moving on to the final section, the market. Upgrading your market. You might want to go for a bigger market. And that's perfectly valid if that's the right thing. If, if boosting the market, maxing the market you go for means a bigger market, then fine. But it may also be a smaller market. It may be um, a more acute problem, or it may be a, a more high-end customer who wants to spend more. Right? Maybe fewer people who've got a bigger problem, but it's a problem you can address. And again, just you know, challenge yourself when you feel that temptation to be dragged back into the normal area of the bell curve. Think, how many of those perfect customers do you really need to achieve your objective, to achieve business success? Right? And be really honest about that. And remember, there's always room at the top of the market um, people have come up with six and seven star hotels now because there were people who wanted more luxury than five star could provide. So there are, they, I think the there's one in Milan, there's hotels in Dubai, right? Now seven stars. The level of luxury is so high. There's always somebody who is prepared to spend more. There's always somebody who wants it gold-plated, diamond-encrusted, one-off special. Okay. There isn't room at the bottom of the market, generally. What you know, what you've got rock bottom at the bottom of the market, and it hurts to hit that. You don't want to be competing down on price unless you know you can win doing that. Much easier to come out with a more exclusive offer addressing a bigger, more painful problem. Right for a smaller market even than it is to try and go mass market and to try and compete against very often bigger players who've been doing it for longer who who can do it more efficiently. Just a few examples then on uh, market upgrade. This isn't a specific example, but a metaphor that I I'd love and I, I use all the time is about fishing. That you can take your little fishing boat out to a pond year after year. Right, you use the same tackle, the same bait, and you always pull up the same fish. And you could be forgiven for thinking, telling yourself, this pond is full of that kind of fish. But that it could be because you're using the same bait. Right? You've used the same method, the same approach. There could be massive fish in that pond. Much better fish in that pond. But you just need you know, you're only getting the fish that you are asking for. So, you know, maybe if you change what you do, you will find that there's actually a whole other markets out there, but you don't know that they're there because they're not responding to what your message. If you want something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done. Okay. The velvet rope effect, another really useful metaphor. Uh, there's a lot of nightclubs, a lot of restaurants um, who have a VIP area, right? Clubs spe specifically. And there's, you know, a, a, another area and there's a velvet rope across that area and there's a guy standing there. Now, the interesting thing is that area may be the same, the tables, the food, the service, everything might be exactly the same as it is in the regular area, but the fact that it's behind that velvet rope, the fact that it's in the area that says VIP, makes people think I want to be in that area. And why? Because it says something about you to be in that area. People want to feel like they're on the inside. People want to feel special. People want to feel part of something. So this takes us all loops right back to brand when we're saying about starting a tribe, start an army, so start something that people can feel part of. Okay. So, you know, add exclusivity. Even if it almost feels artificial, even if you say, I only take on one client every quarter, 
Right? I am that good. I only take on one client every quarter. That's the velvet rope of effect can come into play there because people are then thinking, I want to be that client. Right? Rather than going out and saying, you know, we make websites for businesses or you know, we'll do anything you want. Well, no one's out there with the problem of I need anything I want doing. People are out there. The only problems that are going to motivate somebody to take action are specific problems. They're meaningful, they're painful. So go out and do that. Marketing strategy. You know, this is me challenging myself now. So how could I make marketing strategy applicable to multiple markets or multiple level, levels in the market, right? Is it DIY free? Could there be a five-year marketing plan rollout product, right? Taking it all the way to the limit. You know, I will, you know, help design your marketing strategy and run it for you for five years and guarantee you a million dollars revenue or, right, challenging yourself, pushing it to the next limit. Lots of different levels this can be done. And then finally, I want to leave you with a very fascinating case, the case of the anonymous marketer. And I was running a group a few years ago, and I had one person in that group who was specifically, who had a personal you know, need or interest to be anonymous, and somehow had attracted a particular category of client for whom they were doing marketing services, right? And they were attracting clients and they just happened to have two or three clients who fitted this particular profile. And um, these were clients who were, who had a famous name, but who wanted to be personally anonymous, personally unidentifiable. So thinking along the ideas of, um, say, you know, people who've had a, a, a career in espionage or the military and write books about that thing, but they don't want to be personally connected with it. So they need that kind of curtain of anonymity, right? And uh, so as we were talking about marketing strategy, it emerged this, this thing about, well, what if you specialized in being the marketer for people who want to be anonymous. And um, so my advice was, remove your about page, remove your contact details, remove your application form, right? Put on, yes, these are my clients, but remove any contact, any means of contacting the agency. Make the agency so exclusive that clients can only come to you through a recommendation from a previous client and let your clients know that, obviously, all right? Because, think about it, and this, you know, we, here we're looking at niching down to a razor sharp point, right? You think about it, a client who is in that market, and there are lots of those, there are hundreds of those people, right? They have that specific need, they're like, I know I need my stuff to be promoted, but I need to be protected from it. And they see that, you know, they speak to somebody else who they share the problem with, because people with the same kind of problems talk to each other. And they say, well, you need to speak to, speak to my person, I can give you their card. And they go on the website and they see, yes, this agency, this anonymous black box agency represents my friend and some of these other things I recognize, but there's no contact information at all. There is no way I can find out who is behind this. I know I'm safe, all right? Because if I become one of those clients, there's no way that anyone can even contact my web designer to find out where I am or what my address is and all that kind of stuff, right? It's perfect, but it means stepping out, really leaning out really taking a risk of what seems to be a risk, but ultimately, maybe not, okay? So, quick summary. You can upgrade any or all of those circuit elements, and when you do, you'll find that the other ones adjust accordingly. The temptation to go wide will always be there, and if you succumb to that temptation, it will keep you struggling. 
but by being specific by being focused that will help you it'll help fix you in your market's consciousness it will mean that you stand for something they think you they know what exactly what that means and when they have that problem you'll be there right there in their minds so there's nothing left to do but go look at the circuit that you have now and say to yourself how can we upgrade all of these thanks till next time